Welcome to Invisible, Breaking Through the Stigma of Addiction. I'm your host, Dean Anderson, and this is a show about our community and stigma and addiction and all the great things that people are doing in the community to change the face of substance use. And on today's episode, we have Kevin Daly from St. Stephen's House. Thank you for being here, Kevin. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks. It's good to be, good to be here. Thank you. Oh, it's it. Um, Kevin is, uh, I don't know if you know this, but um, I was... Uh, 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 speaking on two different occasions and I had had a conversation in a public setting talking about addiction and substance use and two separate times when I came off the stage somebody approached me and said do you know Kevin yeah. and I was like I've heard of Kevin yeah. I don't know Kevin yeah. your reputation precedes you as being somebody that's very passionate and working in the field and helping others I hope you know that oh thank you very much all yeah. right so the reason why we have you on the show today is because you are the executive director of St. Stephen's house here in London Yes. yes, one of two houses, yes. One of two houses. Yes. So are you just running one or, or yeah, both? Yeah, I run the men's house and uh, Val Wooten runs the women's house. Yeah. Val Val is on my short list of people to have on the show. Yeah, yeah she was saying. <laughs> yeah, I asked her once before and she couldn't yeah. make it and she was traveling yeah. or something. Yeah. So she's certainly on the short list to be on the show. Yeah. So I, I would love to hear some of your experience on what's been happening over the last couple of years, um, even with the, the pandemic and, and, and you know what you've been dealing with, uh, with trying to, to manage that. So is it sober living? Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a house for people that that uh, it's a safe house for people to live, okay. sober, and um, it's a uh, it's based on the uh, it's a, we call it a twelve step program. It's uh, mm -hmm. um, people need to go go to twelve step meetings and and things like that while they're at the house. Okay. Um, it's a long term house that is safe and um, sober mm -hmm. for people to um, get back into society and. And what it is, there's a, there's, it's usually people after they've had the initial treatment, like a place like Westover or Turning Point or Quinn Horner or something like that, mm -hmm. and then they can come to St. Stephen's House. A lot of times, too, we have to get them right out of the detox. And uh, the reason for, for that is years ago, they'd always be able to go right into a program. And now the people are coming out of detox with nowhere to go. So then we put them into a program once once they've arrived at St. Stephen's mm -hmm. house. Yeah. So tra transitional housing in addition to, so transitional from two different directions, one from withdrawal management yeah. into care and then from from care into um, their own living situation. Yeah, hopefully that's that's where they get to. What happens a lot of times is people come out of, um, out of the um, a place like Westover and then they have no place to go and they just end up back in the situation they came out of which is really not a particularly good thing for people trying to stay for, away from drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. So what St. Stephen's does is it gives them a long-term place to stay. A lot of people come in, they have no place to live, they, have, uh, they, they don't have a job, they have no money. And um, so what, what it does is they're able to stay here at a, for a long term, up to 18 months. And, and if they need a bit longer, we do that too. We're, we're very flexible with them. Um, with the people, what they with their needs and and things. So, mm -hmm. and but hopefully by the time they get out of there, they've either got a full time job or they're back at school and they've got a little bit of money together to get an apartment and stuff mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. which um, you can't do in a couple of months. So that's why it's long term. Yeah, absolutely. So, what what type of services are you, do you provide there to help them to make these transitions into employment and that sort of stuff? Well, we're, we've got connections in the community with all kinds of um, people like. We, we go, they go on either ODSP or Ontario Works and mm. stuff like that. They really work well with us so that they can, you know, pay the rent and, and things. And uh, I think there's a lot of, um, we go into addiction services and, and, and places like that where they can go and get some formal counseling. What we are is, we're, we're, we're mostly is just trying to direct them in the, in the areas where they can go to get the help mm. and um, just, you know, provide a safe place while they're doing it. Yes. Yeah, so you're a hub. Yeah, right? pretty uh, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, yeah. A, a concierge to helping. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I have a lot of experience on my own with addiction, so I can talk to the guys and stuff like that. And, okay. You know, like I can relate, and uh, I've been there, done that type of thing. Yeah, so you yeah. have a... You have a, um, a, a few people working in the house that kind of manage and oversee, correct? No, it's just myself. Oh, it's just yourself now. And, yeah, we just, you know, like it, it's more like a... 
like a safe house to be. It, it's it, like it's it's not a place like Turning Point or Quentin Warren or mm -hmm. something like that. Ours is more is more like uh, it, we get them into the. Um, what what the idea is that they build a community around themselves while they're at St. Stephen's. So mm -hmm. when they leave, they have people in their lives that, because um, I'm not always going to be there. So they got, right. they, I encourage them to have three or four people that they can talk to about anything or, yeah. and then just have a hub of people around them that when they move out of the house, they can just continue on their recovery, you know, in, yeah. in, the, in the 12 step programs, you know. Yeah, um, <clears throat> we had uh, Bev Thompson on last week, mm -hmm. who used to be the, the director there. Yeah. And she was mentioning, um, you know, the value of connection. Yeah, yeah, value that's of connection, key. A, a major part. How do you promote that? How do you, you know, how do you really hit that home with people for them to recognize? Because well, I know in my own work, it's very difficult when you say, oh, you need connection, like whatever. Yeah, yeah, well, that, that's, <laughs> that's, that's one of the reasons why it's a long-term thing. We have, we have house meetings and we talk about that stuff. We... We, you know, they're encouraged to get a get a sponsor, join a home group, and and uh, you know, and that way they make the connections, you know. And, and I and I just encourage it over, and you know, it's just almost like repetition. It was the same with me. Like, uh, people had to tell me more than once, you need to be connected in the community. You need mm -hmm. to get help. You know, I can't do it alone. You know, and uh, so so just over the over a period of time, with their own experience, they realized the importance of the connection. Unfortunately, not everybody get, makes that connection, and they'll they'll leave too early, or they'll you know just go out, and uh, the the connection gets broken, and mm -hmm. they end up in a lot of trouble usually. But uh, mm -hmm. if they can make the connections and get a lot of people in the community that they know and that they interact with, th their chances of uh, success is much greater. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. What. Uh, is there anything that stands out to you that is a barrier to connection or something that you see happens all the time that disconnects people or, you know, makes it difficult for them to find it? Well, a lot of people are filled with fear. The, the, the fear is the big barrier, I think, for, for most of the, most of the uh, recovering addicts or alcoholics. Right. Like you're filled with fear. You don't trust people. There's lack yeah, of trust and everything. Yeah. So that's probably the biggest barrier. And sometimes it's... it's um, a, a lot of times, well, it, it ends up being fear anyways. It's all fear-based, even if it's your ego. You don't want to talk to people or you think you're better or whatever. It's yeah, still yeah. fear-based, you know. Yeah. I, I think that's what it is. The biggest, the biggest hurdle is, is the fear, starting to trust people again and that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, I see it, um, uh, obviously, in my work um, and my own personal life. The, the, the fear is... Um, survival mode, right? Yeah. So somewhere along the line, there's been some sort of uh, trauma or disconnection or something that's happened to create abandonment or fear of intimacy or whatever it might be. Those things get built up in our life and then all of a sudden there's a, a fear of being connected. Is this what you're referring to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's basically what it is, yeah. 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 So then trying to get those people to recognize that there's value in that is really what you're trying to do. Basically, yeah, yeah. That would. Um, we we don't spend a, spend a lot of like most of the thing is like uh, everybody want what what people need to do is change their thinking, right? Yeah. And um, the best way to change your thinking is change your actions. Mm -hmm. So if you start doing the things that are healthy for you, your thinking mm -hmm. will become healthier, right? right? So it's not a whole lot of. Um, I try to keep it really basic and and simple. Like go out and do this, do that, and do the, do the next thing. Right, take put one foot in front of the other, and uh, once you start doing the right thing, your thinking changes, and uh, you start feeling better about yourself. You know, you're accomplishing things. You know, you're staying sober. That's the big thing. Eh? Mm -hmm. Every every day is a is you know it's for people who have been using for ten years and they're all of a sudden they're not using. Mm -hmm. To stay sober a day is a huge thing. So ah, sure. you know, like so, just by doing the right things, doing the next best thing, that's that's the important thing. I think you know. I think uh, people really struggle with the idea. I, I call it reverse engineering. Yeah. You reverse engineer, so you go, I can't deal with my emotions and my thoughts. But if you go do actions, then they reverse engineer and go backwards and start to change those things backwards. But a lot of people can't recognize yeah. that the value in that, right? That's right. Yeah, there's a, there's a saying a lot of people use, fake it till you make it. That's, a, <laughs> that's the type of thing. Uh, 
So, yeah, I, I guess that's what we promote there, that uh, getting it, get into the community and start doing the things you need to do, you know. It's, uh, it's not easy when you're first doing it, that's for sure. What do you think is the, what do you think is the biggest hurdle um, with people that are new that are coming in other than the connection part and the, and the fear? Is there anything that, you know, the barriers that they might have that get in the way that make it difficult? Yeah, well, I think it all just boils back down to, like, self-confidence and stuff like that, you know, like, uh, they just don't feel as good as other people or, you know, because of their their past and, and things, you know, like, that. that's another big hurdle. They're just, you know, afraid to uh, to get into situations that, uh, you know, I guess it just all boils back to the fear part of it, eh? like, it, it just, lack of self-confidence and... Uh, if the if you're thinking about physical barriers, um, there needs to be a lot more um, help out there. That uh, through um, one of the areas that I that I thought that 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 could be a lot more helpful would be um, longer term stays at places like the detox and stuff like that. Like I've I've had experience where they're releasing people from the detox that having fully um, withdrawn from the drugs and the alcohol and stuff like that and they're mm -hmm. out on the street and that happened a, a month and a half ago just to keep people you know a little bit longer and I know it's because of the funding you know like the government says this this and this mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons that we don't go after government funding with St. Stephen's House we uh, we just we get all of our funding from the community. We get no funding from the government at all. And because then the government doesn't dictate to you what you do have to do and don't do. Now, we do have a board of governors yeah. and we do have rules we have to follow and stuff like that. Yeah. But when Sister St. Patrick started St. Stephen's, she wanted to stay away from the government. And because she knew through other areas where she was interacting with the government, there's a lot of barriers there that, that would prevent them. I can bring, like, there's no restrictions as to who can come to St. Stephen's because if we started putting restrictions up, nobody would make it because mm -hmm. we're dealing with alcoholics and addicts that haven't had a chance and mm -hmm. have, have broken all kinds of rules. So, mm -hmm. so, we, so um, without the, so with it, Without the government involvement, it gives us a lot more flexibility to helping people and keeping people for longer periods of time. Like mm -hmm. a lot of times, the governments will say so many days and that's it. Your funding stops. Mm -hmm. We don't have to worry about that thing. The thing we do have to worry about is getting the funding. So, but we do that. With the community has been very generous, like the London Community Foundation and places and and uh, play learners and people like that a lot of mm -hmm. have been giving us funding and stuff like that but we 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 uh we have a lot of uh things like you were earlier the golf tournament and stuff mm -hmm. i think bev was talking about that last mm -hmm. week and mm -hmm. so there's a there's a lot of areas where we do get our funding but it gives us a lot of flexibility so I, so I, what I heard was, is a lot of the barriers are the interactions with, and I, and I don't want to stir the pot, but some of the government funding things and short-term stays and trying to integrate with that where you have flexibility and they have less. I, I yeah. personally have worked in that system and I've seen yeah. all the barriers and seen the funding and we're sending people out into the street when we shouldn't be and, and it's a, certainly a difficult uh, thing to overcome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, that, that is a real real problem in... in uh, not for us, but for the addict, it's a real problem. They're getting thrown into a situation that they just came out of mm -hmm. and expecting to behave differently. But they don't have any tools. And yeah. They're back out in the street and... Yeah. You know, when someone feels defeated and they feel beaten down and they feel like there's no options and then yeah. when they go to look for help and then those the, that help also falls through, um, it certainly is uh, like taking a getting kicked while you're down. Yeah, that's for yeah. sure. Uh, uh, really difficult to overcome, especially when we're already talking about people struggling with connections and fear and the ability to be open with themselves and then here they are now being knocked down yeah. uh, by the people that are supposed to help. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that can be a real problem. Well, for sure. That's for sure. So I, I admire, I really admire St. Stephen's, and I talked with Bev about this last week, about um, you know generating their own funding and being able to uh, do all that work that you have to do. Because it's not it doesn't just show up on the doorstep. I mean, you got to go out and do things to generate that funding. Um, and it certainly gives you a lot of flexibility, and it's a beautiful a lot of work yeah. that you do. Yeah. Um, and it's a one of a kind in the city doing that, right? Yeah, yeah, we're for fortunate sure. that way that... Yeah. 
it, it was, and it was because of people like Bev Thompson and uh, Sister St. Patrick in particular. She mm-hmm. started it and uh, with, without those people. And after Sister passed away, um, if it wasn't for Bev and, and her husband Dave, the St. Stephen's wouldn't be there because, mm-hmm. because of the work they put in the last 20 years before I took over in mm-hmm. 2018. So I just had to follow the example of what they were doing. You know, oh, it, nice. it's, a, it's a good place yeah. for, I went through it myself and uh, saved oh, my life. So. That's a beautiful segue because yeah. I'm gonna ask you about that right after this break and talk okay. a little bit more about that. And before we take our break, I'm gonna remind you that you can contribute to St. Stephen's House and we'll put a little link on the bottom of the screen if you'd like to make a donation and, and help them do the amazing work that they do, then please, uh, search it up, look it up, contribute, see what you can do. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to Invisible, and uh, we're back with Kevin Daly. Um, Kevin, you had um, had openly, you know, suggested that you had lived experience, that you had, uh, you know, been a, a resident at St. Stephen's House in the past. I would love to hear a little bit about your story if you're comfortable with sharing. Sure. Yeah, I was at St. Stephen's House in in. Uh... 91. St. Stephen's House opened up in 82. I was in there a couple times before that also. Cool. I wasn't one of the people that, that uh, stayed sober right away, but I kept trying mm-hmm. and uh, eventually uh, things started falling into place for me. But uh, it's because of places like St. Stephen's House and uh, places like the Salvation Army and the, the mission and that I stayed alive long enough to get the message that I needed to get to stay sober. Mm-hmm. and. Uh, so it, it was a it's a it was a wonderful experience. It was a place for me to go, and just to get well, you know, so that I could start looking after my life, you know. And it was like taking a a fifteen month break from reality, almost like just so that I could be surrounded with the things I needed to be surrounded with to to get uh, sober and to live, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a, a, a fruitful life, you know. Like mm-hmm. I, since I left St. Stephen's, I haven't had to go back on the, in the system and that and. And so it, it was a good investment for the, um, when I was on Ontario Works, for them to invest in me to get well. And it was a real good investment because I haven't had to go back since then. And that was nice. for a short period of time. And uh, so, w- w- so that's, that's part of the benefits of it. And the good thing that is, is um, really positive about St. Stephen's, rather than being in the system, it costs about 7% of the cost of being hospitalized or detox and stuff like that to stay at St. Stephen's. So it's a very um, good, um, I don't like to say it's, it's not profitable for, for me, but it's profitable for the taxpayers to have yeah. places like St. Stephen's that'll, that'll run through donations and that, that you're mm-hmm. not putting a burden on the system, you know, like yeah. it's a lot. So it's a vital thing to have in the community. Yeah, and uh, it's all community supported. So we can certainly use more of them. I I I noted from my experience when I, I worked within residential care withdrawal management that we were always struggling to find places for people to go. And it was yeah. like, oh, let's try here, let's try there. We made phone yeah. and phone calls, and uh, a lot of people were met with nowhere to go. Right? Yeah, and that's very sad because then what happens is they're back into the system and mm-hmm. they're back into using. It's just like almost like they don't have a chance because of the lack of support mm. out there, you know, and it is, it's always so hard. Like I get three or four calls a day asking if, if there's any, you know, any rooms or anything like that. And mm. it's almost, uh, it's almost a hit and miss, you know, like it's mm. just, uh, it, it's sad that there's so many people that are falling through the cracks right now, right, right now. So as many services as we as we can, there still has to be a part where the person needs to be willing and, and to seek out those services and participate yeah. in them. So what was that point for you? What was the thing that turned you into, you know, saying, okay, this is what I'm doing and I'm, and I'm here, or the, the turning point, so we call it, where yeah. you know, things change. Is there a specific time that you rec- recognize yeah, that? Yeah, there is. It, it was almost, it was a, I was in and out of the, um, in and out of the, uh, being sober, I kept going back out using and, and that. And then uh, one day I woke up, I can remember like it was yesterday, I, I was just lying there and uh, I looked up and there was this great big tall guy I knew looking over me, asking me how I'm doing, not so good. But uh, I, 
uh, the first thought that came to my mind that day was uh, I had four children back in Hamilton and I woke up and I thought, what if my kids need me one day? And from that day to this, that was the, um, the driving force or the, something that I've always kept in, in mind every time I wanted to use. It was just something. So that, what that did for me, that didn't, you know, that, that made me go to the places that I need to go to get the help that I needed to get and was the driving force for me to continue doing it even in, in spite of anything else that was going on in my life. I, I had, to, but that was the thought that came to me, like what if my kids need me one day? And I hadn't been anything, like I hadn't contributed to the family for 15 years and I was on skid row and off and working and not working and just in and out of people's lives. But that, that one thing was the thing that kept that, uh, to this day was the thing that I think about whenever I, you know, think that things aren't the greatest or something like that. I thought it's a lot better than it was, that's for mm -hmm. sure. And so as a result of that thinking and that day, what were the actions that you took? What did you do over the coming weeks when you, you know, Well, I just, that? I sought help. I yeah. sought help. I went, you know, like I, I, I that, that, that night I ended up at the, the uh, men's mission. I was in the men's mission and then I, uh, after that I was able to get into, uh, get some help and I, I and I uh, through through living at St. Stephen's it, it gave me the opportunities to, to seek the necessary help that I that I needed to get mm -hmm. to, to get well right. you know I just and I start putting one foot in front of the, the other start um, following some directions that's what that was the big thing I needed to start mm -hmm. following some directions and have some faith that it'll work you know like I could see all around me there's people around me that were getting well, and I wasn't, you know, so mm -hmm. I, I had to start changing the way I was doing things. And mm -hmm. just like I said earlier, just start changing my actions and my thinking started changing. Yeah. Nice, nice. That's so um, we, uh, you know, you, you do that, you do that work. We, we can all note that it's, mm -hmm. it's scary, it's uncomfortable, it's difficult. There's yeah. a, a lot of uh, things to overcome. Is there a point in your journey where you kind of felt like, oh, I'm, I'm there or something has changed? I know we, we, we want to focus on the process, not an event, and that we yeah. don't actually arrive somewhere. But there, was there a part in your journey where you kind of went, oh, wow, things have really changed. Like, well, this is different yeah. now. It was a funny thing that um, when, I was, when I was drinking in that, I used to take this uh, young fellow to his hockey games and stuff like that. And uh, I'd always feel out of place at the arena with the other parents and stuff like that. Like, and they were just regular working class parents taking their kids to the arena, but I couldn't talk to anybody because I felt so less than them. Mm -hmm. And I can remember one of my friends, I used to, he used to take me to the arena with him. And uh, wa I was watching his kids playing hockey and stuff. And this was a few years into my uh, getting well. And I can remember I felt perfectly comfortable there, you know, and that was a big thing for me. I, I didn't feel less than, I didn't feel better than, I just felt okay. You know, and that was such a huge thing to feel just okay in my own skin, feel okay around the people. And they're just the regular people that 10 years prior to, I felt so less than and couldn't even talk to and didn't want to have any, any association with. And, and, and I felt perfectly comfortable in that situation. And that was one of the, the points where, you know, like, was they call them aha moments type thing, or like, I'm getting well and... You know that that's that was a bit of a like a, a spiritual awakening with me when just realizing I'm just the same. I'm no better, no worse. It's okay just to be me. You know, and that was a big thing for me. You know, it seemed small, but it was really big. Noticing that stuff. You know, as you're getting well. You know, yeah. I I love that you keep saying the word getting well, yeah. and you keep saying it in that in that regard. It's not yeah. that I'm sick or there's yeah. something wrong with me. Yeah. In the regards of focusing on illness, I'm focusing yeah. on wellness yeah. and moving yeah. towards getting well. Yeah. And then yeah. I hear, and I also hear the ability to. When we we're talking already earlier, we we're talking about you know the connection yeah. and being able to feel connected. And, yeah. and and it's not so much. I think I think people think that it means that everybody likes me and I'm going to go and, yeah. and and connect and, and yeah. belong. But it's more about not giving a crap if anybody likes you, and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for lack of better words, it's the belonging is being okay with me. Is that yeah. what I'm hearing? That's right. It's just okay to be Kevin. I don't have to be anybody else. I used to have all these ideas of who of what I wanted to be, and uh, it was like a huge weight was lifted off my shoulders when it was just 
it's okay to be you. You don't have to be anything else. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're not going to please everybody, but you're going to be okay. Yeah. You know, that's all. It, it was a good feeling when that, when you start feeling like that. Eh? It takes a lot of work, but it's worth it. That's for sure. I think there's a lot of people that, you know, that aren't even struggling with substance use disorders yeah. that have those feelings and feel yeah. that way on, on a daily basis and recognize what it feels like to not feel like they don't belong or feeling less than yeah. uh, and those sort of things. So is there anything specific that you attribute to, um, you know, in your day-to-day -day actions and things that you did on a regular basis that helped you to feel that way? Well, yeah, just um, looking at myself, like, and and like you you were saying, the big thing that helped me to feel that way is my connection with the other people that that mm -hmm. were in my life at that time. Start, fo you know, following directions. Looking at myself, I had to look at myself. I had to mm -hmm. look at, okay, where are you coming from? Like, you know, um, what what my thinking was and where my thinking was off track. You know, and, and I had to re I had to re look at all that. And it was some stuff that is quite you know, when you're realizing all this th things about yourself, it can be quite startling, you know, like you think, oh, geez, am I really like that? It's like when I look back now at who I was back then and who I am today, it's just like it's like two different people, really. Yeah. It's like a whole, I can't believe that that was me and I was doing those things, mm -hmm. you know, and it was because of the disease of alcoholism, mm -hmm. but a lot, of, some of it was too because of the way I was, you know, mm -hmm. like I, even before I started drinking. But all this, but how it manifested itself was was alcoholism. Like I was an alcoholic, right? And then everything just starts coming out. But the actions that I did then and how I live today are two two, two totally different things, you know. Like I virtually, you know, I was just a non-existent father and a non-existent mm -hmm. husband, and uh, mm -hmm. I had to change all that. It, it was a harsh thing to look at yourself and realize those things, you know, and then yeah. start having to make amends and changing your life and mm -hmm. amend the things that you did in the past. And then that's that's how I that 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 was huge for me too, right. to reconnect with all my kids and my grandkids. Now I got eight oh, grandkids nice. and stuff, and I have a good relationship with all of them today because of the things I did. Amazing. Just started following a few rules, you know. Amazing. And, yeah. A few suggestions, not rules, I guess, but rules really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so uh, I mean, I'm hearing being teachable, I'm hearing being humble, I'm saying um, get in line with your, your values and what you know is important to you, and then from all of that comes self-esteem and self-worth and connection yeah. and feeling yeah. better. Uh, Kevin, if you can give one super quick piece of advice to everyone out there who's struggling with substance use disorder, what would it be? I'd just say for me, what I had to do is never give up, you know. Never give up. Yeah. Just keep keep trying one foot in front of the other. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being on the show. I appreciate it. I appreciate your story and I appreciate all the work that you do in the community and helping everybody and keep doing what you're doing. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for watching Invisible, Breaking Through the Stigma of Addiction, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>